Today, I'm joined by Trevor Goodchild, who is a Facebook, could say Meta, uh, ad policy specialist. And we're going to find out some real insider tips and secrets, which hopefully will help us to debunk the myth that is Facebook ads are easy. Mm, <laughs> and that really is a myth, as I think Trevor will certainly agree with us. Welcome to the episode, Trevor. Thank you so much, Neil. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast. Yeah, so I, I want to dive deeply into this because I think for a lot of us, um, it's it's complicated, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you know, where where to start? Because you know, well, we know that Facebook obviously is this omnipresent platform that you know, almost like as a marketer or as a communicator, business owner, entrepreneur, you feel almost obliged to know about and obliged to try and conquer. But it does feel as though you're on a bit of a crusade to be able to do such things. I mean. Why is it so complicated? Well, so in just a little bit of my background is I've worked at Facebook in advertising. I've worked at Facebook and tech supporting Facebook servers and remote access tools. So if Nike was running 50,000 ads on Black Friday and Facebook servers are like, oh, I can't handle this. And they start to crash on your end. You're trying to load ads manager. It's not loading. It's a blank white screen. On my end, I'm getting a phone call at 3 a.m. in the morning with my uh, Facebook Apple iPhone and Oh, the servers are down. The servers are down. I'm not trying to impersonate Paul Revere's coming. It just comes out that way. But and then I have to co coordinate with the engineers at Facebook and Menlo Park that write the code for the platform to stabilize it because Facebook's lost like, you know, a million dollars a minute that ads globally are not live. And then after that. I was promoted to working as a project manager at Facebook for the creator monetization program, working with influencers that have a thousand, a million, you know, a hundred thousand followers, helping them test out new products for Facebook, stars on reels, digital collectibles, things like that. So let's just say I have a lot of experience at Facebook in multiple departments and I have a good perspective on this. And one of the hardest parts about Facebook is simply the fact that they were built as a small company and whether you're calling it Facebook or Meta, they haven't scaled very well because really what happens when you employ a bunch of automations to do the majority of the decision making for it? Is this following policy? Is this not? Is a lot of human context is lost in the process where maybe you're flagged and it isn't a bug or a glitch as maybe you think it is. It's just not transparently communicated what specifically you did to violate the policy. And if you're learning to walk, but you're never allowed to get up again after falling down and going back to the crawl. How do you learn to put one foot in front of the other? The learning is really stunted for advertisers on Facebook because Facebook is less than transparent about why someone got shut down, what led to this, what ad copy or part of the funnel was equaling this ban. And then what did Facebook want in the first place? It's It sounds kind of silly that in a platform that has so much traffic and that generates so much revenue, they s will not be specific about <laughs> what they actually want from advertisers when there is a situation of policy violations. They speak in broad, vague, general terms, which doesn't help if you're trying to tell your copywriter, hey, we got shut down from this ad. This is specifically what to adjust. And that's what I end up helping ad agencies with because I've worked there and I can share that. But on a whole, I would say 90% uh, have no idea why they got shut down. Mm. So I want to get obviously to, to how you kind of, you know, work with that sort of scenario as, as we go through this conversation. But I'm curious when you say about, you know, Facebook meta um, was basically a small business with a lot of automation in it. And kind of obviously that um, gives a certain style, a certain culture. Is it is it still driven by Mr. Zuckerberg himself? Is he is he still kind of sort of there influencing the culture, the style? Because because a lot of obviously the media reports say just how influential he you know very much is, even though obviously it's a massive organization now. Is is it still kind of driven by personal ambitions there of the founder? That's a really interesting question. I would say on some level. So a little background to give context for my answer. Uh, I've worked at Microsoft and I help with the launch of the Xbox 360. I've worked at Apple Computer helping with the launch of the first iPod Nano and also working at Facebook. And in my experience, 
one of the things that's super important in any kind of job when we're talking about a Fortune 500, especially, is company culture. Like, what is it like at Microsoft versus Apple? Well, Apple is a lot more relaxed. It's a lot more laid back. You still, obviously, it's still a job and there's still policies and procedures you have to follow. But it's less of the kind of factory mindset of cracking the whip, you know, do as you're told. Sit down, shut up and do your work. Right. At Facebook, there is a lot more progressive philosophy, I would say, that, that you know, Zuckerberg definitely influenced with his startup new tech kind of stuff. But it depends on what you're doing there. Right. If you're a contract worker and you're outsourced by a contract company, it's very similar to the Indian caste system where there's the undesirables and untouchables versus the elite which are the people that are full-time employees directly employed by Facebook versus just the contract workers. So that whole move fast, break things, we're hip, we're progressive, we're, we care about the people, we're not an old stodgy company that's you know antiquated like Microsoft, we're the new biggest thing. It sometimes gets lost in translation when there is a, a class system inside of Facebook itself but I would say as a whole, right, given the fact that I've worked in three different, very different departments from each other at Facebook over the process of the last seven years, I would say he the kind of progressive inventiveness and, and the think outside the box philosophy, it works to some extent. Right. It, it's there. But that isn't I, I like that. I think that's why I lo I've loved working at Facebook. Uh, the higher up I worked, the better it got. Pretty much the more perks I have, the easier it was to integrate, you know, uh, business development with improving a process, especially when I was a project manager there. But the lower down you are, the more you get caught up in red tape, just like any company would. But I think really like the biggest problem is that the entire business model that Facebook is based on, it hasn't grown as much as it should since they started as a result of that they have employed more and more automations which has reduced the personal hands-on touch reduced the one-to-one -one ratio when it comes to people actually seeing your ads so inside yeah there's a lot of company culture stuff that is still the same which is really cool but then the pandemic also changed things now teams are working remote you may have five people on your team each in a different state it's hard to develop the same kind of community that you had working in the office before. So the pandemic has affected this as well. I would say it's a changing company and where Mark is focused is also different, right? We saw his attempt at the metaverse, which flopped because the avatars weren't designed very well. And there was just a basic survey uh, of the audience of, hey, do you want this? Do you need this? Is it filling a need that is not being met? Is this connecting a gap in the market? It wasn't. No one really had a need for the metaverse. And he approached this as trying to create or artificially create a need or desire in the market that just wasn't there, right? So a lot of changes could happen to, to make it better. I think we have some of the original kind of scrappy startup feel to Facebook still, but more and more as the years go by, it's more corporate. You know, mm, how do you think it's kind of morphed as, as an organization in that kind of rebrand to Meta? Because obviously we, we all grew up, you know, those of us <laughs> of a certain age kind of grew up with Facebook as the well as the de facto kind of standard, if you like, for a social network. It was what everything else, you know, aspired to be. And, and now it's kind of, you know, I, I guess for, from Zuckerberg's kind of, you know, directional you know, long-term strategy when, you know, I can remember him saying probably must be 10 years ago now, we intend to be the center of the internet, not just the center of social media. We intend to be the center of the internet. And, and I'm guessing the transition over to Meta was kind of almost one of those early steps into being, we just want to be all encompassing. So you'll kind of, you'll live in our space, you'll network in our space, you'll work in our space, is, is that kind of almost taking a very different emphasis in, in the whole meta sphere now rather than metaverse, you know, is it the whole kind of meta sort of you know, proposition? It, it feels very different to what Facebook was. Do, do you see that kind of coming through? Well, it's like Alphabet is Google's parent company. You know, they just wanted to make sure they differentiated a parent company from Facebook, the social media site, because they purchased WhatsApp. They focused a lot of energy on monetizing WhatsApp because WhatsApp is 
the most used social media app in a lot of other countries, some of them third worlds, where they don't have as reliable access to the internet, but on their phones they do. And so a lot of the focus on WhatsApp has been about monetizing that as a checkout system for people that are operating really small SMBs for e-com, um, people that are even just creating vegetable baskets in the local farmer's market, right? So they've shifted a lot of attention to WhatsApp. They've shifted a lot of attention towards this metaverse, which again, I think is a failed ID, uh, a failed, um, it's it's a failed venture at this point. Maybe it can improve because we've had these kind of virtual workspaces for a long time and none of them yet has really taken off. And it's interesting if you look at how the vision that Zuckerberg has for the metaverse is actually described about living and, and eating and sleeping and working in a virtual environment. It almost sounds word for word as the description of the matrix uh, <laughs> from the movie. It's like, did we not learn that, that we don't want to give up this world that is around us for a virtual one that is, you know, not as, as deep in, in depth, but you know, who's who's to say the futurists, we can have a whole other conversation. I love technology and I am a sci fi author as well. So I love futurism. But, you know, there's a point where the rubber meets the pavement. And is this functional? Is this real? Is this not the direction that the company is taking as a whole? I think is shifting away from Facebook. I think Zuckerberg wants to put Facebook ads and the entire business model created for that on an autopilot running. This is part of what we've seen with you know, the increase of automations, especially after laying off over 20,000 people in the past six months, starting with November of last year. And so there's less staff there, more machine reliance. He, he wants to create, make Facebook into this kind of, you know, self-perpetuating funnel versus focusing actual time and energy on it. Now, if you go to like Facebook, fb.com slash news or whatever the news site is for the newest things for Facebook, you'll see the projects are working on very AI centered. It's they're trying to, you know, ride the tide of the market with this with this AI gold rush, this new Silicon Valley, right, for AI. And that's where the focus is for Meta right now and a lot of businesses. Mm, so so are humans actually reviewing the ads? I mean, let, let's kind of migrate a little into the kind of the advertising space, because I, I know you know, obviously you have a huge amount of value to add there. But it's great to get that insight from you as to kind of the reality, because most of us just believe what we read in the in the news and obviously yeah. You need to take that with quite a pinch of salt. So thank you for that bit. The the kind of the big question I've got is this thing about AI versus human and, and really within Facebook meta is I, I, are humans actually reviewing the ads right now? Or is this is it really transitioned over to the automation that you talk about? Rarely do humans actually review the ads. It's a, a matter of scale. You know, when you look at economies of scale, ideally, when there's improved demand for something, it becomes cheaper and mass distributed. Well, the mass distribution vehicle for this is the automations that Facebook uses to monitor the ads. I mean, you think about it, they've decreased the staff by thousands upon thousands of people. That's not going to really foster more hands on you know, review of the ads. That's a lot of the times the problems advertisers face is that they feel, oh, someone's looking at my ads, therefore I can get away with saying something that someone who's human would get the context of, whether it's an idiom or I'm using a term that maybe could be misinterpreted as something else, but oh, it's okay because Facebook's actually got people looking at this. No, they don't, very rarely. Um, even if you appeal something, if you're, you're clicking on the re request review button, most of the time, that goes to another machine who evaluates the first machine's work. Oh, no bias there. Just machine reviewing machine. I'm sure they're going to prefer the humans. Incorrect. So the, the problem is, is that unless you're actually chatting with a human being at Facebook ad support, which is increasingly more challenging to do because Facebook itself has created like, I think four bridge pages between you and actually reaching a person now. And then when you first get on Facebook ad support chat, it's actually a bot. It's an it's a bot you're talking to when you first begin the chat. So there's it's like those call centers. You try to call AT and T or you try to call the electric company where you live, and there's like long hold time, and there's a robo dialer voice that's trying to. Well, if you want this, press this. If you want that, press that. And it's all these barriers between you and a human being. Try to call your post office. My God, good luck there. 
similar, very similar. They're they're trying to decrease their reliance on human beings and increase the automation. Again, keep it like an automated funnel that's self-sustainable. The problem with that is that machines don't understand human context. A lot is lost in translation. And also, there's very little coaching. There's very little help to an advertiser. Maybe one ad being rejected isn't that bad of a deal. But if that ad had certain flags in it, that are prevalent in how you frame your copy and you create 50 more ads with those same flags in them, even if they're small flags, maybe these flags aren't enough to shut you down, but the automations are now going to count those 50 ads as 50 separate violations that you're having because you didn't catch it in the first ad because there was no coaching opportunity for Facebook to say, Hey, this is specifically why you've been flagged. This is how to get it compliant. Right. So that's part of what I help my clients with is I help them decode exactly why they've been flagged, what in their funnel led to this happening and how to correct it to get ads compliant again, because Facebook, unfortunately, doesn't offer that service in a very reliable way. Right. The people you get on Facebook ad support are often outsourced. They've never run ads that made money. They have no experience making making money on Facebook, but they're telling you how to do it or how to get beyond a policy block when they our outsourced workers barely above a sweatshop and it's like, yeah, your trust was very fragilely placed in their hands. And often I've seen people actually who weren't banned. Maybe they had an ad rejected, but they took the advice of Facebook ad support and instantly become banned because it was the wrong advice. And so it's one of those things where, I mean, I understand the efficiency of using machines, but because most advertisers don't speak bot language, they haven't programmed these, they haven't worked with the engineers that created these automations, the logic for how these automations scan ads, the decision-making process of what the machine decides on what, what is that line where you're, you're approaching getting flagged, you're not there yet, now this is too far. That, that Venn diagram, that overlap, that little small window of, this is okay. It's still converting. But if you went one step further, now it's banned. There's no education of what that is. And so it's really hard for Facebook advertisers to operate within a system that is God, probably 95% uh, automated. I think the special ad categories of like jobs, employment, politics, real estate, things like that, those may have more human eyes on them because they are a higher risk for Facebook PR wise. If you have a political ad that goes wrong, right? That's, that's Facebook's butt on the line if it gets to Congress or something like that. So I think there may be more human eyes on the special ad categories, but other than that, most of it is all machines. Even when you are trying to appeal a decision. This, this is so, thank you so much. Trevor. I mean, this, this is making me feel so much better because I thought it was me and I thought it was my clients and a lot of the marketers listening to this and business owners will be thinking, oh, well, thank the Lord for that. So Trevor's actually giving me permission to not feel like it's just me because it feels like <laughs> there's quite a lot of others in this loop. And it feels like there's so much more that either Facebook, but obviously um, sort of somebody like yourself can do to kind of give that tuition, give that guidance and not you know, allow people really to fall into this trap because it feels like this is an ever decreasing circle that once you're in that loop, yeah, to break out of it, it's, it's either painful or it's nigh on impossible. So well, what are some of the best ways really to prevent, you know, a Facebook ad account from getting disabled? Because this feels like this is a really pertinent question. Sure. And I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. But before I do, let me let me let's 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 play a game and imagine that that Facebook is your girlfriend. You love her so much when when everything when your relationship is going well, she's making you tons of money. But when it comes to ad policy, it's not you. It's me. So it's uh, that would be that'd be the best way to phrase that. But uh, as far as like good, you know, best practices to as far as as far as best practices for not getting shut down by Facebook. You know, I say one of the first things is just make sure you're keeping up to date with new policies as they come out. We saw a slaughter of Facebook ad agencies going down in a dumpster fire when 2020 hit. Right. One of my clients back then was actually a guy who was from Asia. He was living in California and he was running a face mask business uh, uh, on a, uh, a shop he already had for Facebook masks before the pandemic even hit. But because of the new changes with 
a lot of people trying to price gouge selling face masks for like, you know, $300, this cheap piece of cloth made for two cents in China, you know, and it's like, because of that price gouging, Facebook created a new policy specific to the pandemic, specific to talking about the pandemic, how that's phrased. If you're challenging the World Health Organization's philosophy on what COVID is or isn't, you know, and all that, a whole bunch of new policies came out. Well, guess what happened? So many advertisers that had ads running in autopilot that worked great before suddenly found themselves in a new landscape and they didn't they didn't realize it happened. They weren't keeping up, you know, and so because of that, they got shut down in mass. A huge amounts of money were lost. We also saw that at the last presidential election for uh, United States of America in November of that year, um, a whole bunch of accounts went down because of the same thing, because people weren't monitoring how ad policy had changed specifically in regards to politics because a lot of changes have happened there. So that was, that's the first tip. Make sure you stay up to date with all the new Facebook ad policy changes. Second tip I have is, and it's all, it's also an article I wrote for social media examiner and which is a great magazine for social media and learning how to run Facebook ads, but it's how and why to delete Facebook ads. And the thing is, is that if you don't know why you've been shut down, you're very crippled when it comes to trying to run ads again, because you'll, repeat the same mistake again. But if you know that this ad has been rejected and you want to make sure that you're not jeopardized by this later, I would screenshot it so that you have a copy of the ad copy in the creative and the headline beneath the creative. So you know what it looks like and you know that was rejected for your records, but then delete it. The reason why I say that is because when a new Facebook ad policy hits the platform, Similar to if you run a new Facebook ad, a new Facebook ad has to enter into the learning phase, right? It has to match the, the bids uh, on the ad auction on the newsfeed to see, you know, are you being outcompeted by another advertiser targeting the same audience that you're targeting with a bigger budget? You know, they have to calibrate essentially your ad into the newsfeed before it becomes optimized. And the same thing goes with new ad policies. There are thousands of ad policies. When a new one is released, the machines themselves have to integrate it into the monitoring systems globally. I mean, how many people do we have on Earth now? Seven billion, eight billion? I forget, you know. When I was a kid, it was like three or four. <laughs> now it's eight. It's crazy. And so that's a lot. That's a lot of integration that has to happen when you first have uh, a new ad policy. And so as a result of that, what happens? Sometimes Facebook does a spot check. And they'll globally scan every ad, which is an enormous task. And in that process, I have actually witnessed this happen both in my account, probably back in the day in 2016 or earlier, and also in, in clients, ad agencies accounts that I've worked with, the bots turned on an ad that had been off, even ones that have been off for years, turned it on, ran it for like 10 seconds or 30 seconds, rescanned it and then retroactively punish that ad account for a violation. This could be a previously rejected ad. It could be an ad that used to be compliant that now is not compliant with the new ad policy, and now you're punished for a new change Facebook ad, even if you ran the ad at a time when it wasn't against policy, right? So that's a good way to stop yourself from getting trapped by something that isn't even live or active anymore, is delete the old ads out of your ad account, but screenshot them first to make sure that you have a record of that. Um, I would say another great tip I have is to sound realistic. The The problem is if you go back in time to Eugene Swartz breakthrough advertising, you look at courses on digital marketing. A lot of them go by the problem pain solution formula where you introduce a problem, you emphasize the pain point, and then your product or service is the solution. How heavily and hard you kick those pain points will determine if you're going to get banned on Facebook for having too much negative content, graphic content, things like that. But at the same time, you know, it's one of those kind of hard rock and a hard place thing, right? Because you want ads to convert. You want to kick the pain points. How do you do this in a way that doesn't get you banned on Facebook? So there's that sweet spot because the highest converting ads are going to sound the most spammy. Lose, you know, a hundred pounds in seven days. Click learn more to find out. Oh, hell yeah, I want to click learn more. That'll convert at the wazoo. Your cost per click will be under a dollar, under 50 cents, probably real easy. But then Facebook will ban you because they'll say, hey, that sounds like a scam. So that sweet spot between it is compelling enough 
it's kicking the pain points. You're identifying the words or language that your target audience is using to describe the the roadblock they're facing that your product or service solves. But don't go over the top. Don't don't try to sound like too crazy or unrealistic or how to start a business ads. They often get flagged for promising too big of a result. Make a million dollars in 90 days. Click, learn more to find out. It's like Facebook. And you know what? I've worked with Harv Eckert and his social media marketing team. He's the author of The Good Millionaire. This dude has made millions of dollars. And I'm sure he can teach you how to make millions of dollars. And even if what he says is correct, it's about the perception, Facebook's perception of this. How does Facebook perceive your copy in their ecosystem? And that's what you have to keep in mind when you're writing copy. This is not the same thing you can do on Google. It's not the same thing you can do on, on YouTube or Yahoo ads or banner ads, right? It's its own ecosystem because Facebook's a private website. Remembering that really helps you avoid bans that you would normally get trying to copy and paste your ad copy from other platforms, maybe more lenient than Facebook is. So I would say that's really important. I would say one of the other tips I can give that I see very few ad agencies do that is a huge, huge tip is to identify specifically how the Facebook ad policy automations flag your particular niche and industry. They operate differently, right? If you're trying to serve Forex, like I would, or uh, crypto on Facebook, I would not even try that. But, you know, how, let's say the automations flag an ad about positive mental health versus an ad on how to make money online, how to start a business, or how to do weight loss, right? Weight loss ads, you're going to run into a huge risk of the personal attributes flag, which is a flag that Facebook flags you with if they feel like you're calling out a specific subgroup of people too specifically making them feel singled out. Whereas if you're talking about something like how to start a business, business development, how to make money online, the most likely flag you're going to get for that is an MLM flag, which in Facebook's lingo is called misleading business practices. And it's one of those things where if you sound like you're promising the moon, it doesn't sound realistic to Facebook's eyes, then that's going to get you flagged with MLM. So like that industry of how to build a business is different from, let's say, a skincare uh, company, right? They're going to face different challenges based on the business model. And I think keeping note of that, which you can do by, you know, joining ad hack groups online, you can look at forums on Reddit, you can look at other people's experiences they've had running ads and see what those are and, and make note of that. I think being able to customize your ads per your niche, realizing where the danger zones are, specifically what type of flag your type of business gets is going to give you, uh, you know, an advantage, definitely. And I would say another tip I have is to be aware of who's on your Facebook business manager. Something that started happening around late 2018 and then 2019, right before the pandemic shut everything down, was that Facebook started being overly aggressive at tracking the history of everyone who's on your business manager and, you know, your or the meta business suite, whatever the hell they want to call it now. But on the people's tab on your business settings, which Facebook has also created three additional bridge pages to try to reach, which is not user friendly. When there's more steps, that is not effective, Facebook. That is not an update. Um, but when you're at the business settings and you're at the people tab, maybe you run an ad and you see you've got different roles. You've got people that are writing ad copy, people that are marketers, people that are business managers, or developers, or you've got multiple marketers. And you look on that people tab, if they're running ads on their own or they're in another ad, ad, ad agency or maybe even last year for another company they were working for and they're still on their old business manager, if that company gets a shutdown or if that person who's on your business manager independent of you working with another company or on their own is getting shut down, Facebook spots will trace that person and then pretty much black mark anything they touch. And so I've seen that happen a lot where a business manager – of a social media marketing agency I worked with, they were completely fine. And what happened is one of their ad guys had an expired credit card. And when Facebook's bots tried to auto charge for ads that had ran in the past, it came up as a decline payment. They immediately assumed guilty first. They thought this guy was intentionally trying to pump a dump. Right. The, which you see in the clickbait farms in, in the Malaysia and Philippines and Mumbai. Right. And Bangladesh. They do that sort of thing. 
and that's why, you know, one bad apple wins it for the bunch. We, it's so hard for regular agencies to function on Facebook because of these bad actors that do exist. But the problem is, is that the agency I was working with, they had no idea this guy had these problems. He didn't tell it to them. And their whole business manager got shut down because of something someone else did that was even an accident. And he fixed it, but the agency's business managers are already disabled. If they had done that due diligence and they had made sure to be aware of the ad history of the people they let inside their business manager, as well as the current ads they were running, they would have sidestepped and avoided that completely. So those are some of the top tips I have uh, just from the from off the top of the head. Oh, man, that's great insight. Thank you so much, Trevor. I mean, one of the th well, there's two things there that I've really picked up on. One is the the scalability of these challenges and issues. If you're an agency, it's all very well being a single business and maybe a you know micro business where you've got the one credit card, you're the one you know account within the business manager. You're kind of in charge, and the buck stops with you. But at a, in a bigger kind of agency level, where you're how, handling multiple clients, probably with multiple campaigns, with multiple multiple you know add you know campaigns and and stuff running sort of you know through these accounts the scaling of this problem where there's that ripple effect that then often you know could almost be become almost like a virus within your account and it kind of infiltrates forever i had no idea that this was kind of either happening or that this could be a real issue and maybe again for a lot of people listening to this maybe there's some of these kind of little the moments that you've just identified there that are the issues. And actually it's less about the ad copy, which often is the, you know, the obvious thing for somebody who doesn't really know the detail. And actually it could be a lot of stuff behind the scenes. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah well, it's, it is interesting because, you know, SMBs, small to medium sized businesses and bigger agencies that uh, are operating. Some of my clients have spent over a million a month on ads. You know, I've worked with ad agencies of Tony Robbins. Uh, it, it, you know, they spent ungodly amounts of money on ads. It's great for them in a sense where there is a bigger risk if their ads get shut down. There's a lot more money that that 500k a month is bringing in, uh, and so it, it's it's a bigger risk. But at the same time, they usually have more options because they usually have access to more ad accounts. So if they're able to correctly identify why they were shut down they can potentially relaunch easier. Whereas someone who's a smaller SMB using a smaller budget, less access to less amounts of ad accounts. It's, it's a bigger challenge because one of the changes Facebook has done again, this is because of the actual bad actors that are out there running it for the rest of us, but they changed the ad account creation limit on the Facebook business manager, AKA meta business suite, because used to prior to probably 2021, you could create, I think there was like a default 50 ad account creation limit. When I first started working at Facebook, my ad account creation limit was a thousand. I created, I could create a thousand ad accounts. It's insane. Now you can, your ad account creation limit is one. So if you're an SMB, you know, and let's say, you know, I've, I've worked with some of these companies like a jewelry shop, right? You're a local jewelry shop in Bristol and you're trying to get your, your sales and maybe you're a small company and like 40%, or 50% of your annual revenue comes from a Black Friday sale. And then Facebook shuts down your your ads because you said one word wrong. You got one word wrong. You don't know what it is. Facebook then shuts you down. Your ad account creation limit is one. You can't you can't create another ad account. You can't relaunch. It's it's hard when people are stuck in these situations where now they're down 40 or 50% of their annual revenue because of this one little thing. So it's become harder and harder because Facebook has gotten stricter and stricter when previously, you know, prior to 2021, you could have uh, ad account creation. I think after 2021, they, they changed it to three ad accounts. And then as of this year, it's only been one. And so it leaves people very little room to make an error. And again, learn and self-correct and relaunch again, because everyone is treated as if they are a malicious character because Facebook's like, you know what? We don't have time. We don't have staff. We're not going to differentiate these these people from each other. We're going to treat everyone as if they have a bad intention. And again, it's not most advertisers. One of the mistakes they make is they, they feel like it's personal. It's not personal. It sucks. It's not personal. It's just because of the reliance on automations and machines. And I think that if we had a situation where Facebook opened up two or three more call centers or something like that for ad support, who could manually review more ads instead of relying on automations, we'd have less shutdowns, more happier public sentiment 
and we would be able to also create more jobs, more economy. Obviously, there's things from creating jobs in general, but it would it would definitely help reputation management for Facebook's tarnished brand for all the stuff that we see. Google hashtag Facebook disabled me. You're going to find hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, regular Joe Smos, you know, out there. Maybe they're just a soccer mom. Maybe they're just, you know, uh, uh, an accountant. They're, they've never run ads at all. But they, they got a new phone and they logged in from a different location and Facebook's locked them out. Now, 15 years of their life is gone. Photos, pictures, family, everything, right? They, they have no access to it because they didn't pay for ads. And if you don't pay, you can't play. There's no customer service, really. So it's just one of those things where... I don't know how realistic it is, especially with everyone fearing a recession, that Facebook is going to take the due diligence to hire more people. But that would solve this issue. That would I mean, it would definitely alleviate it. I don't know if it 100 percent solve it, but it would it would alleviate this and reduce the amount of shutdowns that maybe are done. Not necessarily because someone is violating ad policy. That happens enough. Sure. But maybe they just use the wrong word and they didn't realize how the machines were seeing that word. And so I think that would help. Mm, it's, in, it's so important, isn't it, to, to really kind of stop and think this is a, a platform like no other. And I think what Trevor's kind of telling us, everyone, you need to be listening to this, is that you need to do the deep dives. This is about the content. It is about the copy. It is about your budget. It is about your business manager, meta business suite, whatever we want to call it. It's going to be called something different tomorrow. <laughs> um, and it's kind of yeah it's about really paying attention isn't it this this is a beast unto itself it's it's something that is different to all the other platforms that you can be doing you know your promotions and advertising through i i'm really keen that people get a, a bit of access to you actually trevor um and i understand you do some kind of discovery calls is that right are people able to contact you and kind of yeah. explore this further if they have budget and if they have you know a need and i'm guessing kind of agencies could be listening to this thinking oh we've got to talk to this guy because you know we need help yeah well instead of guessing or trying to do a google search or reddit search or cura search or linkedin search or youtube search and then hearing these uneducated opinions from people that are like hypothetically this is how it's supposed to go you don't you can't trust any of these sources you can definitely get help from someone who's worked directly with these engineers that are editing creating modifying these automations that ban people and so i can help folks get clarity on how to be compliant how to make sure you know exactly why you were shut down and how to get ads active again uh, my website is jetski shaman.com uh and that's um jet ski like you're on the lake on a jet ski and then shaman like you're a, a magician, a shaman. <laughs> That's a funny story behind that name. But uh, yeah, jetskishaman.com slash connect. My email is trevor at trevorwgoodchild.com. You could also just simply Google disabled Facebook ad account. You're going to find me on the first page of Google for my blog, Jetski Shaman, or Google my name, Trevor W. Goodchild, or find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find because I'm the only person in the world that offers this particular service and expertise from facebook so yeah i'm happy to help out just you know uh offer a free discovery call we can talk about what issues you're facing with ad uh you know disapprovals rejections disabled business managers you want to prevent this from happening just you know schedule a free discovery call and i'm happy to jump on and see what we can do to help thank you so much Trevor, for your, your tips and your insider wisdom here because you know, I think you've you have debunked you know, a lot of the the myths that I think a lot of us have been suffering under, you know, for many many years actually. And I'm, I wish we'd had this conversation you know, quite a few years back because I think I would have realised it's not just me a lot earlier. But uh, I'm so glad now to know, and I'll sleep easier tonight knowing that it isn't just me. There's a big old system out there, but uh, help is at hand. So thank you again for your time today, Trevor. Thanks for having me on, Neil. It was a pleasure.